Roll for Crit presents how to play Twilight Struggle in five minutes or less or more. Twilight Struggle is the game that pits the USA against the USSR in a battle of wits, subterfuge, and also actual battles. Designed by Jason Matthews and Ananda Gupta and published by GMT Games and based on the Cold War. Man, such a fun war. The goal of Twilight Struggle is to earn victory points by playing cards and controlling countries. Each player will pick a side, US or USSR, and receive a set of influence tokens in their color, plus a hand of eight cards to start. The USSR player also receives the China card, which goes face up in front of them. Then, each player gets to place some of their influence tokens on the board. First, the USSR player places theirs in the amount and countries indicated on the map, plus six tokens that can go anywhere they want in Eastern Europe. Then the U.S. does the same according to their locations, also getting to place seven tokens anywhere they want in Western Europe. We'll cover exactly how influence tokens work in a bit. Players also have tokens at the start of the space race and military ops tracks. The game is split up into sections known as turns in which multiple phases will occur. The first thing you'll check each turn is the death contract. This begins the game at level 5, indicating peace. If it's ever at a lower number, then at the start of each turn it moves one step closer towards peace. And just so you know, if it ever hits the bottom, nuclear war occurs and the player that triggered it loses the game. Nuclear war is bad, okay? Next, each player will draw cards from the main deck until their hand is filled up to eight cards. Most cards have two major aspects to note, a star in the upper left corner with a number indicating its operations point value, and text indicating the card's effect when played as an event. Cards with a white star are beneficial to the US player, while cards with a red star help the USSR player. You could end up with both types of cards in your hand no matter which side you're on. Some cards can be helpful to either player. There are also scoring cards which trigger the scoring of the different regions of the map. I'll explain that later. The third phase of the game is the headline phase. During the headline phase, each player will secretly choose one card from their hand and then both players flip them over simultaneously. The card with the higher operations number is activated first. Carry out its instructions then do the same for the other card. If a player plays a card meant for the side that they don't control, then the other player gets to carry out its text as if they played it. If the card has certain conditions that haven't been met, then nothing happens. Afterward, either discard the card or remove it from the game if instructed to. Even if its effects weren't able to be carried out to the full extent, an event card is still removed if necessary after it is triggered. The next phase is the action phase. Players will now go back and forth playing cards, starting with the USSR player, for a total of six individual actions action rounds. Each action round sees each player playing one card. Unlike the headline phase, which uses the card's number values purely to determine which is played first, during the actions phase you can opt to use these values as operation points that you can spend. Here's what you can do with your operation points. You can place influence markers in any country on the board that you already have a presence in, or one that's adjacent to one of those countries or your superpower location, the US and USSR respectively. Keep in mind, you can only influence countries adjacent to the ones you were in at the start of that action round, not ones you added to during the current action round. Now, in the top right of each country is its stability number. If you have tokens in that country equal to or higher than this number, you have control of it. Flip the token over to its colored inside to indicate this. If both players have influence in the same country, then you'll need to exceed the other player's influence points by an amount equal to that same stability number in order to maintain control. It costs one operations point to place one point of influence normally, but the cost gets bumped up to two points if you want to place it into a country that your opponent controls. You can also use an operations point to make a realignment roll. Choose a country your opponent has presence in that you want to get them out of. Next, each player rolls a die. Players add one to their die roll for each adjacent country that they control, one if adjacent to their superpower, and one if they have more influence in the target country than their opponent. Whoever has the highest roll after these bonuses then gets to remove their opponent's influence from the country in an amount equal to the difference between the two rolls. If it's a tie, nothing happens. Each realignment roll only costs one operations point and you can make multiple rolls in the same target country with the same card if you wish. Finally, you can spend all the points on your card to attempt a coup. Again, choose a country you want to oust your opponent from, but this time only the active player rolls a die. Then add the value of the card you played to the die roll. If that total number is higher than the stability number of the target country multiplied by two, then the coup was successful. For that, you get to remove enemy influence tokens equal to the difference between those two numbers. If the difference is greater than the number of enemy influence there, you get to make up the rest by adding your own markers to that country. A coup attempt also 
also moves your military marker up the military operations track a number of spaces equal to the value of the card played, and if the coup was in a country with a stability number marked in red, known as a battleground country, then that degrades the DEFCON status one step closer towards nuclear war. Pay attention to the DEFCON status as you play, as the level it's at may prohibit you from attempting coups and realignment roles in certain regions. Before playing a card, you decide if you want to use it for its operation points or as an event. If you play it for its points, then the event text does not trigger, unless it's a card for your opponent. In that case, you get the points and they get to carry out its action, in an order of your choosing, so make sure it's not something that would help them too much. Also, you have to dedicate all of your operations points to the same task, so you can't split them up between placing influence and making realignment rolls. Some events have ongoing effects that require you to keep them visible or to use a marker as a reminder of their effect. The China card is a special card that stays in front of a player and doesn't add to their hand size. It can be played like a normal card instead of one from a player's hand, after which it is passed to the other player for potential use in the following turn. The other important card type is scoring cards. When one of these is played, both players have the chance to score victory points based on their status in the indicated region. Here's how it works. There are three scoring levels in a region, presence, domination, and control, each worth more victory points than the last you get points equal to the highest level you qualify for. For presence, you must control at least one country. For domination, you must control more countries than your opponent and control more battleground countries than them too, and you need to have at least one of each type. For control, you need to control more countries and control all of the battleground countries in that region. Finally, you get a bonus point for each battleground country you control, and for each country you control adjacent to the enemy superpower. Total up each player's points and adjust the scoring track accordingly. Note that there is only one victory points marker. For each point you earn, it moves one step on the track in your direction, but the same is true for your opponent. Scoring cards are important, and some regions have additional special rules, so make sure you read the cards. The final thing you can do during the action phase is attempt to move up the space race track. For each step of the track, you'll need to discard a card of a certain value. You don't get the card's points, and its event doesn't trigger at all, so this is a good way to get rid of cards you don't want your opponent to benefit from. After discarding the card, roll a die. If the result lands in the required range for the next track space, you get to move into it. The first player to move into a space gets the listed victory points on the left side, while the second player gets the amount listed to the right. Players also receive bonus abilities by moving up to certain levels of the space race track, but these abilities are cancelled out completely if the other player gets to that level as well. If your die roll is unsuccessful, nothing happens, and you can only commit one card to the space race per turn. After both players have gone back and forth playing cards for six rounds, that phase is over. Often you'll have one or more cards left over in your hand as a held card, but note that scoring cards can never be be held and must be played if you have them. Now check the military operation status. Each player is required to play a certain number of military operations, such as coups, equal to the current DEFCON status number. For each unplayed point on that track, your opponent gains one victory point. These markers reset back to zero each turn. Now move the turn marker one space to the right and start all over again by refilling your hands and beginning a new headline phase. Once turn 4 of the game begins, from then on, players will draw up to a hand of 9 cards instead of 8, and they'll carry out 7 action rounds instead of 6. Also, a new set of cards known as mid-war cards will be shuffled into the main deck. At the start of turn 8, the late war cards get shuffled in, though hand size and round counts stay the same. If either player reaches 20 victory points, they immediately win and end the game. If either player has control of Europe while scoring it, they also immediately win. Otherwise, after 10 full turns, one final scoring takes place for each region on the board. The player with the most victory points after that is the winner. In conclusion, influence, realign, coup, control, learn to stop worrying and love the bomb. That's Twilight Struggle in a nutshell. Did you get all that?